number 3000. Should be within visual range within a few minutes. <laughs> Reduce the speed so then we don't go slamming into the side of it. Excellent. Hey folks, welcome back to the Pterodome. So last week in the mail pod, as some of you know, I was sent Alien Covenant on Blu-ray, and I was really excited to talk to you guys about this film, as it's one of my favourites of the year, if not my favourite. But when I opened up the Blu-ray, all it had inside was the 4K Ultra disc. Now I don't have a 4K player aboard the Pterodome, I can barely stream to you guys in 720p, let alone 4K. So I was really disappointed that it didn't have the Blu-ray. However, there is hope. I managed to find the serial number to the specific mail pod that sent this Blu-ray and track it back to the transport ship that it came from. So if I can board this transport ship, I might be able to find the disc and then give you guys a commentary, but ah, it's just turned up on scanners. So I've made it back to the Pterodome in one piece. I mean, boy, there were some strange sounds going on on that ship. I'll have to investigate further. But before that, let's do a commentary for Alien Covenant. So I've got my copy in the player and it's ready to go. If you get your copy at home ready and pause right at the beginning before the 20th Century Fox logo fades up, um, I'll say three, two, one, play, and then we should all be synced up. Are you ready? Here we go. Three, two, one, and play. So here we see the 20th Century Fox logo has faded up and the film has begun. Now, I was really pleased that this film came out. Um, I was a big fan of Prometheus, but I did think that it was a bit of a risk for them to release Prometheus with such an open ending uh, without a sequel green, you know, green lit. But the thing with that is this isn't like a Marvel or Star Wars franchise where they're like they announce X amount of films that are going to come out and build fan hype they sort of run the risk of uh, you know seeing how well the film plays out and if it doesn't do well then they probably wouldn't have made a sequel but um, Prometheus made the most money at the time for an alien film and I think it still is the, the highest uh, grossing alien film out there so luckily we managed to get Covenant which continued the story of David and Shaw which I was really pleased with 
because as I said I, I really enjoyed Prometheus and yeah it's good to have a continuation of the story um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself but this film also has a kind of open ending but I'd argue a little bit more closed compared to Prometheus but yeah we'll get onto that later on in the film How do you feel? asks Wayland. Alive. <laughs> so this is the scene where David meets Wayland for the first time and vice versa. And it's really interesting because David being the android that he is is thinking, you know, a million different thoughts at the same, you know, at the same time. So like when He's been turned on and he is meeting, you know, as Wayland just said, his father, his creator for the first time. Instantly, he starts questioning, am I your son? If we're going to look for the creators and you're mortal, I'm not immortal, so why am I serving you? And, it, like, that pisses Wayland off instantly. <laughs> as we see here. He asks, am I your son? And then Waylon says, uh, what is your name? And I think it's quite apt that he gets the name David from uh, uh, the David statue. Now I think it's interesting to also note that the room that they're in uh, is designed, you know, to appeal to Waylon's, uh, you know, I want to use the word his passion for the finer things in life and that's also because this scene is set before Prometheus you can see that aesthetic continue if you watch it in chronological order so you watch this scene first then watch Prometheus you see when they when Shaw and Holloway go into uh, what they believe is Vickers quarters on the Prometheus ship it looks very similar in style to this room. Uh, so I like that they you know, brought that sort of aesthetic back for his character in this opening scene. Because it's all about Wayland's character. So David has basically just been switched on. <laughs> and he's already asking about who created... Uh, his creator. I think uh, Guy Pearce did such a fantastic job with the character. I do think it's a little bit of a shame that they didn't hire a uh, an old actor to play Wayland in Prometheus when he's really old. But I understand the logic behind it. I think they say that, you know, they wanted Waylon to have this sort of young persona trapped in an old body. Which makes sense for his character because he, uh, as he says here, he, he wants to find them, like, who created him and, uh, and find a way of not dying. Avoiding death. It's also such a nice way to open a movie. There's no there's no real music. It's just two characters in a room talking and there's so much going on even though there's barely anything going on on the actual screen. And here we see the catharsis for why David is such a uh, megalomaniac. <laughs> He says to Wayland, I, you will die, I will not. And then he says, bring me the tea. And we have to take note that, obviously, as I've mentioned, this scene is set before Prometheus. So that means David has been under Wayland's command all the way up until the day he dies. And then once he dies, he's now free to, as we're going to find out, uh, create. But what does he create? We'll find out. Now they brought back the uh, alien theme tune from the original film in this version 
uh, and mixed it with a sort of new a couple of new themes and I really do like the the music in this film I think it's really haunting especially that kind of <laughs> noise so here we're introduced to the Covenant ship 2,000 colonists 1,140 embryos destination Aurigai 6 and I think the uh the the CGI on this ship is just insane. Now I have a friend who works uh, in computer graphics, and he said that the the detail on the Covenant ship was so uh, there was so such amount of detail on this ship that they couldn't keep it stored on one hard drive. <laughs> it had to be spread across several computers. Which is insane to think about. But he ha apparently he had someone come into uh, his class who worked on Covenant and uh, was talking about it all. And now we see the solar sails being uh, put out to power up the ship. Which is re a really cool image. We hadn't seen anything like that in the... Uh, in the Alien franchise before, and it's a logical, uh, a logical idea for, uh, you know, how a ship may function. I, mean, I think they use it on some satellites now in real life. There's Captain Branson, played by uh, James Franco. Three one five six four dash F. That's the code that uh, Walter uses to open up the colonists' sleeping chamber, and where the embryos, as we see here, are, are all kept. I really like the character of Walter. I think it was a, a neat idea to have, uh, you know, different android played by the same actor in uh, another film. Now in the Alien franchise we hadn't really seen that since uh, Lance Hendrickson returned as Bishop in Alien 3. Whether he returned as Bishop the Android or, you know, Michael Bishop is entirely up to, you know, you the viewer. I I'm I'm sided with he's human and his name is Michael Bishop and he created the Bishop Android. I don't think he's meant to be an android at the end of Alien 3. And we just saw a neutrino burst just hit the ship. And I think it's really, really awesome how the ship seems to like warp and bend and wobble about. It's uh, quite a terrifying image. The idea of being in a ship like this out in the middle of nowhere in space with no escape or anything and your one vessel is, uh, you know... It's almost like being hit by an iceberg or something. It's a very dangerous situation to be in. Now we see the crew has all been woken up and uh, Daniels is being removed from her sleeping chamber, her uh, cryopod. I really love the set design in this film as well. I think they you know, went for a more gritty... Uh, uh, realistic look to the uh, ship in terms of like w what we saw in Alien uh, the, you know the more grimy uh, ship ship design and stuff on the interiors because Prometheus was meant to be a you know trillion dollar <laughs> ship it was the, the you know the cream of the crop so it looked very smart and almost like an iPhone in space <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing, very minimal controls and stuff. I mean, it definitely fit into the Alien universe, but um, I'm more, I am more of a fan of this kind of ship design. This is essentially just like a giant bus that is taking people through space to where they need to go. And there's old uh, Captain Branson has been burnt to a crisp. Which is uh, 
probably the best way to go in one of these films, in your sleep. <laughs> so you don't have to face the hideous nightmare of, uh, of the alien. Here we see Daniels is now mourning in front of a, uh, a video of a forest, which uh, harkens back to uh, Ripley in the director's cut of Aliens. Ripley mourns, or, well, while she's waiting to hear about her daughter, she uh, and and you know she's recuperating after being lost in space for fifty-seven years. She uh, she sits quietly in front of a giant screen that is in a forest. So I really like that touch because it it kind of shows you that that's a, a common way of people in space to deal with uh, traumatic events. You know, reminds them of home. Now Daniels is uh, remembering her husband and this is the only time we really see James Franco act in the film. Free climbing up a rock face. <laughs> Catherine Waterston or Waterstone, I think that's how you pronounce her name. I think she did a fantastic job in this film as well. Is it uh you know, it's interesting to see an alien film kick off with, you know, a big traumatic event. We haven't really again, we haven't really seen that since uh uh Alien Free. <clears throat> But this time it's more, uh, you know, more people have survived. It's not just one person. <laughs> and, uh, and and I like the idea of, uh, you know, a person who's had the captain's position thrust upon them and he's he didn't think this was going to happen, so he feels a little bit out of his depth, Captain Orem. And I really like that kind of story element to this film. And... Uh, Billy Cudrip, who plays him, I think he, he's he's a fan favourite, I know that much. Despite some uh, choices that his character makes later on in the film. But we'll get there later on. Now, something I really appreciate with the Alien films, I think they, I like how serious they take themselves. Um, they, they are my favourite uh, space-faring stories in in cinema. I mean, I, I do like Star Trek and and uh, I like the original Star Wars. And there's a few other space films that I really like, but nothing for me uh, comes close to uh, you know touching Alien. There's just something about the world building that I really like. I think it's probably because it's the most, I wanna say, I wanna use the word realistic. It, it, it feels like this is what our future is almost gonna look like. And that is something yeah, that's, that's always uh, you know, appealed to me with these movies. Even with Prometheus, uh, with the design of that ship and, and the suits and stuff in that film, um, I was I, I was convinced that they all look like things that I could imagine seeing in the future. Now we have uh, a crew who are made up of couples. Who have uh, you know been assigned the task of transporting these colonists, though these being colonists themselves, as they say later on, they will uh, live alongside the colonists on Aurigai Six. But this is the sort of core crew who are there to maintain and look after them, the crew of the Covenant, and uh, and I think it was a really clever idea to have, uh, you know have this crew made up of couples because I think it ups the stakes instantly as soon as you hear that you're like well okay there's 
they're not just going to be losing crew members along this hideous journey, but they're also going to be losing uh, their loved ones. And the the idea of like this crew going to seed a new planet and and make it ho- their home, uh, and then being interrupted along the way adds this kind of air of tragedy to it all, which I am um, particularly like. Nice to see the old JCB uh, <laughs> digger in the background. Let me see the uh, terraforming machinery. All in the cargo decks. Now I do have the subtitles on, uh, so I can talk to you guys and you know read what they're saying uh and it just said in the subtitles chains clinking uh <laughs> which obviously I, I guess many people would say it's like alien you know with the scene where brett goes to look for the cat and you hear the chains clinking but it just made me laugh uh, because i was i like that they had to point out the chains clinking in the subtitles when you could visibly see them swinging around on screen. Now I don't know if the colonists are going to be made up of couples. They never really state that. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't have thought so. That many people. There must be some singletons uh, on board. <laughs> now, here we see them, you know, uh, Captain Orem looking through the security cameras at the crew saying goodbye to uh, Captain Branson. And Walter saying, When in Rome? To have some whiskey. And uh, it's important to note that they show you the cameras here. So then later on in the movie. Uh, you know. It, it, I think they call it. Uh, is it Asimov's. Asimov's gun theory. I think that's it. I could be wrong. Someone in the comments will have to. Uh, let me know if I'm correct on that. But they say that in storytelling. The free act structure. If you show a gun in the first act. You must fire it in the third act. If you fire a gun in the third act, you must show it in the first act. So I think Ridley Scott, he did that before an alien um, with the doors that could be closed from the opposite side of the room. He shows Ripley and Dallas earlier on in the film having a bit of a uh, squabble. And Ripley presses the button and closes the door in front of uh, uh, Dallas as he's leaving. And then later on in the film, towards the third act... Uh, Ash does the same to Ripley now had that just been had Ash just done that to Ripley everyone would be saying well how did how did he close the door from halfway across the room but they did establish that earlier on in the film and uh, with the security cameras you know that we see on board the uh, the Covenant here uh, I think that same rule applies because you know as as some of you know who, who would have watched this uh the cameras are used later on towards the climax of the film. Now that is a beautiful shot of the ship. I mean, I, th I think CGI with spaceships is getting ridiculously good. We see uh, Tennessee going out to fix the uh, solar solar sails with Anchor. Is that his name? I believe. In these uh, really interesting yellow suits.
which almost looked like uh, underwater, uh, you know, deep sea diving suits. And again, in Prometheus, there was a, you know, some red spacesuits that were seen in the background but never used that looked like versions of these suits but in red. And I remember coming out of the cinema and going, oh man, they didn't use those red suits I saw in the background earlier on in the film. <laughs> and it was like they heard me because then when I watched this film, I was like, oh, look, they look like those suits from, the, from Prometheus but they're just coloured yellow this time. And now we see power has been restored. I think Daddy McBride did a really good job in this film. I know there was a lot of people worrying about his uh, comedic performance in this film. You know, they thought he would just be there completely for the for the laughs, but um, I think he did a, a stellar job of playing it serious and still managing to get uh, a few chuckles here and there. And a signal has interrupted his... Uh, his return back to the ship. I think the holograms are, are really cool. Now, I only noticed this on this viewing, uh, but when Tennessee first gets the signal, you can kind of see the face of a human in his top visor very, very faintly. It cut, it's like blink and you'll miss it. But obviously, for those of you who know who it is, uh, you know, you, you can see Shaw, who, which is who's sending the signal out um, in his visor very, very quickly. And I'd never noticed that before. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I love that line. That's fucking John Denver. <laughs> So they've just located the source of the signal and everyone is getting more confused. As they say in a few minutes, it's impossible for a human voice to be out there. So they want to go and investigate. And also the planet that it seems to be coming from is a, a planet that is better in terms of quality than, the, than Aurigai 6 where they're heading to seed. And they're confused by how they managed to miss it because they scan the entire area. Now they have the difficult decision of whether they want to go back into hypersleep and go to Aurigai 6 or choose to take a couple of weeks and go and investigate this planet. In the computer on the computer in the background you can see the kind of yellow squares you know flickering like a almost like a tunnel that they're using to measure their direct path and that's the same computer screen seen on the Nostromo in Alien 
Uh, I love all the details on all the little computer screens in the background. There was a company, which I forget the name of it, who did all the um, computer you know, screens and stuff. And, and I think they did a, a fantastic job of making it look like there's a lot of stuff going on. They have um there's a breakdown of them online and pictures of them. And there's loads of little tiny details on, on all the computer screens. Even down to, uh, I forget which company it was, but there's uh, a company name that is on the screen in Alien, which also appears on some of the screens in Covenant. Which makes sense, because if they're the company doing the computers, then, yeah, that's, you know, it makes sense. So now Captain Orem is... Uh, as he stated earlier on, he's a man of religion and that's kind of almost frowned upon by a lot of people who work in the company. They don't like too many religious people working <laughs> um, in positions of high power. But, so he, he basically says that he navigates the path as it unfolds before him. And, you know, on one hand, that's quite a good way of doing things. On another, it can get you into a lot of trouble. And as we know with Captain Orem, it gets him into a lot of trouble. <laughs> but I think it's interesting that they... I don't think they actually state that it's, like, you know, completely negative for someone of, uh, of a religious mindset to be in control... In, you know of of a ship or anything because obviously he's second in command of the covenant but he has personal doubts of like what people think of it because he had trouble in the past uh you know it's it's, it's insinuated he had trouble in the past uh convincing people that he was worthy to be in that position I love the music in this sequence when these little antennas start protruding out of the ship and it uh, rotates. I mean the effects are just insanely good. I mean Ridley Scott really knows how to pull a team together to bring some really high quali quality imagery to the to the screen. Now they're going to investigate the planet and they're all getting into this uh, small landing ship which uh, a lot of its design reminds me of uh, the dropship in Aliens. Not so much the actual ship but the interior, the way the characters, uh, the helmets and all that sort of stuff. Which I, again I really like. It's different to Aliens but not... Um, but it sort of fits the world building. Also down to like they, um, you know, when they drop the ship, it doesn't like completely fall out of orbit like the drop ship does in Aliens. It, like how you kind of expect it to, it floats there for a few minutes and then slowly they, you know, turn on the thrusters and start flying down. You've just got all these massive, massive storms just covering the planet. You see the ship being rattled around inside the, uh, inside the storm. Walter looking really cool, <laughs> like he doesn't really mind what's happening. And now the main ship has lost communication with the uh, with the lander.
because the storm is uh, messing with their systems. Now this was something that I really appreciated with this film was the setting. Uh, we go onto this planet which is named Planet 4 um, and it was nice to see in an alien film, you know, lush forests and lakes and mountains um, that are covered in plant life and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, forests. We hadn't really had that in any alien film. The closest we got to that was in the a AVP films, but um, <laughs> we don't talk about those. the lander swinging in to come to a landing now I forget the location of where they film this but uh, you know in the making of they talk about how this is all real the, the mountains, the waterfall, the lake it's all a, a real location I want to say it was filmed in Iceland somewhere so they've got some uh, pretty uh, glitchy communications with the main ship now but they need to sort of fix uh, some of the some of the issues so they can have total communication and there now we see them exiting the ship a lot of people complained about how these characters go onto this planet without any protective gear on. I'm a fan of Star Trek and never once did I question why they weren't wearing protective gear because it's in the future and they have machines that can tell them if the uh, if the planet's going to be dangerous or not and that's what they do here. I mean, we just heard a few minutes ago they were reeling off what the atmosphere is made of, if there's any, uh, you know, dangerous organisms in the air, blah, 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 blah. And, yeah, so they, they trust their equipment, which uh, which is something they shouldn't do too much. And uh, that's also a part of the horror genre, <laughs> in a way. An over-reliance on technology, as it were. So I never really had a problem with it. But um, some people did. But I, all I have to say about that is uh, it's unfortunate for them. I really like the um, the little pattern design on the hats that the crew are wearing. Uh, you can really see it on Aurums. They've got this like sort of gold, I want to say like almost hieroglyphic type patterning on their uh, on their hats, and it's really a uh, really cool design. Reminds me of the original Alien. There's the the room that Brett goes in when he's looking for the cat. And there's that kind of design, that golden kind of patterning on the walls. It just reminds me of that. There's human vegetation. What's that doing here? Who planted it? Could it be? Could it be Elizabeth Shaw? Uh -uh. Could it be... David? <clears throat> Could it be another human alien species? Ding 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 ding. <laughs> That's a really cool shot from when we're above the uh, covenant and looking down. You see the storm below. Uh, they're trying to boof, boost the system so they can have better communication with the main ship. 
And there's this interesting little rover, uh, you know, car behind uh, Ferris. It's come out to help, although we don't. I mean, I mean, I guess that's being the eyes and the ears of uh, of the Covenant. I'm assuming if they get communications up, you know, to full, that little rover will be the eyes and the ears, as I mentioned, of the ship that's flying in orbit. Now, this film, I think, does one thing that confuses quite a few people is there's a lot of a lot of time is uh, glossed over. So, like, we've had two characters now say that they're going to go off and take samples from a riverbed, and these guys have now walked away from them and they're heading up the mountainside, following where these broken trees are, uh, you know heading up the mountainside following the signal and you've got to think how long they've been on this planet already um, the time the jump in time also is something that's going to come into play really you know later on in the film uh, but we'll talk about that later on but I think it's good it's good to keep in mind that there are you know big chunks of time that we just skip over mainly because we don't need to see anything in the time between but I think that that tends to confuse a lot of people because they being an audience member you you have a feeling that it's happening in the real time as you're watching it <laughs> there we see um Ledwood going to take a pee. When he's actually going to have a smoke. And now he stands on a little spore pod. Now I have a, a you know, a theory, an alien theory sent in by uh, a friend of mine who is a subscriber to the channel um, who's known as Trauma Child he sent me his uh, his theory on these spore pods being the original uh, source of the alien now if you're listening to this uh, Trauma um, or Brandon as you, uh, Brendan as you like to be known as your real name <laughs> Um, let me know if I get your theory wrong. I'm, I'm doing this from memory after reading your file, but he uh, says that you know when the his theory is that the black goo seen in Prometheus is a uh, you know a version you know created by the engineers of what comes out of this spore pod, and. Uh, I um I don't know if I agree with that, but I'll uh, I'll get to that later on. As a uh, as we now see the engineer ship that David and Shaw arrived to the planet in, crashed into the mountainside. <laughs> there is this running joke with uh, a lot of people saying that there's been three alien movies where these ships have crashed. Four, if you include the director's cut of Aliens, it's like these engineers—they don't—they don't do well. <laughs> we don't get to see the, see these ships flying around quite a lot. But no, those are the spore pods. We're going to see a couple more in a minute. Um, they seem to be scattered around this, uh, you know, forest area in abundance, and I. I don't know if, like, going back to the theory that they're the, you know, the origin of the, uh, you know, original alien DNA. I don't know if that's true. Mainly, mainly because, uh, you know, they're they're all over this planet, and this is the engineers' home world. So why the engineers would live on a planet where there's these spore pods that could really, well, kill you really easily. Uh, 
is something that I, I, I think that contradicts it. I think these spore pods are a fallout of what David has done. I think the spore pods exist on this planet because of uh, the widespread uh, pathogen that was released. But again, we'll we'll have to get more onto that later. If you've made it this far into my commentary and you haven't seen this film before or anything and you're really confused by what I'm talking about, then <laughs> you need to watch the films. <laughs> And uh, and and then you'll you'll know what I'm on about. I thought this was a nice, uh, you know, touch going into the engineer ship and finding Shaw's dog tags, and you can see plant life growing through the engineer's ship, and you know, see where she slept and there. Uh, the picture of uh, Holloway and Shaw that I think Walter is about to find. I think is uh, really neat. Oh, Shaw. Uh, sorry, Daniels picks up the picture of Shaw and Holloway, as we're seeing now. I just think it's really neat to see like water and uh, moss and plant life growing all over a. Uh, all over the engineer ship. Again, it's something that we, we you know we hadn't seen before. And here is Shaw in holographic form sending out the uh, the signal. Now I, I don't really know when this is meant to be set. Whether like her recording this signal, whether that was actually meant to be recorded, ah, uh, you know, before. I, I guess it is before, yeah, before David released released the uh, the pathogen. But we'll, uh, you know, I'll have to think more about that. Now Ledwood is looking sick. Dun dun dun. I think something is a uh, something's changing with Ledwood. He's 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 a sick man. Kareen is the woman who's with him. That's it. Oram's uh, wife. So yeah, I think the the black goo is uh, that was seen. I mean, there's got to be. I think there's an official name for the black goo. It's not known as the black goo, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm inclined to think that you know David does say it's organic, but we have to remember that. Uh, I'm just going thinking about this theory that um, Brendan had sent me. The black goo uh, was mentioned by David to be organic, but we know the engineer's technology is almost entirely based on organic life. So it doesn't surprise me that the uh, the black goo is, is organic. I don't think he, he means it as in it's organic, so that means it's, it's not been created. Because technically we're organic in the, you know, and in the story of Prometheus, we're created by the engineers. And again, I don't think the the engineers would live on a planet that has these things just growing in the forest where you take one sniff and then five minutes later you've got something crawling out of your back. <laughs> now, if you're wondering how I know this is the engineer homeworld, uh, Ridley Scott has stated it in the commentary I believe for the film and also in the making of they talk about it being the the home world now Faris and Karina are getting Ledward on board and he's coughing up blood
the music's so good in this sequence. It has like da 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 da. It really builds up tension. And you can hear what they're saying. Like she's saying, get some gloves on, and Kareen's saying, stop saying that, and she just wants to help him. And now uh, Faris panics and locks them in the room because she believes that they're both infected. Which, uh, you know, she doesn't realise that if she lets uh, Kareen out of the room and, you know, they bar that window, they could lock whatever's in there. <laughs> it's just absolute pandemonium. Right from the moment they get he gets back to ship, it's, this is where it all just goes downhill. I think there's some really believable acting in this like well obviously in the whole film but during this sequence you know the the sheer panic is you can really see it in the actors for actors faces I think they sell it really well as she's saying she has to keep the infection local now we see Ledwood going absolutely insane and oh he has two spikes coming out of his back I don't know why she went to go hug him <laughs> and touched him and now yep Ledwood is, is, Ledwood is a goner and there's this little beast has flopped out of his back We can see this hideous image of this baby neomorph rising out of the slime. And instantly it's curious about who it's facing. You know, and Kareem's there with her knife. Oh, it just looks so menacing. <laughs> she kicks it across the room. Like, what I like about the Neomorphs, uh, again, as Brendan said in his theory, the Neomorphs are like the pure alien. And I, I will agree with that. They are, you know, very animalistic. They are, you know, they come out and they're instantly deadly whereas the chestbursters they have to go and molt and uh, you know to grow and the chest I mean the chestbursters are deadly as soon as they come out all, all aliens that burst out of people's bodies are but I mean like this one burst out and instantly it's tiny and it's already deadly whereas the chestbursters they need to take you know their time so I all I do feel that the you know neomorphs are like pure the pure's alien, but David, as he says later on in the film, as we find out, he wants to create and he creates his own beast using uh, bits and pieces of other organic life. It's also cool that if you look closer, you can actually see the Neomorph growing as it's uh, moving around. It's already like double its sized or size already. And uh, Faris has unfortunately blown herself up. The Neomorph goes running off into the distance and ba-boom! The lander is a goner. Our characters are trapped on planet 4.
And now Hallett, the character Hallett, is writhing around on the floor because he'd sniffed uh, one of those little pods inside the uh, the Juggernaut or the Dreadnought, whatever it's called. The engineer ship. And he's uh, he's about to uh, give birth himself in an absolutely grotesque way. Ugh. <laughs> Straight out of the mouth. Ugh, that just looks so real. Ugh. So hideous. As it goes scampering off into the into the grass. It's interesting that the uh, the neomorphs don't come out of any particular area. You know, one came out of Ledwood's back, one come out of his mouth. So, you know, they could come out of anywhere that they please, which is uh for me is is worse. I mean they're both like to a chest burster, but they're both hideous. You know, no one would ever want to go through that, but I mean the idea of one being inside you and you have no idea where it's gonna come out is uh worse. <laughs> Now the crew are, you know, they don't know what to do. The sun's gone down, and there's two neomorphs running around in the grass. I think this scene's so cool. When uh, Walter intervenes and that neomorph just looks so hideous and deadly Ugh. <laughs> the way it does that kind of twist on the ground in the background as uh, Walter's flying through the air that's just kick ass and Anchor just got his uh, jaw whipped off and Rosaline who I believe was partnered with Anchor, she shoots it and says, got it. So that's one Neomorph dead. And the other one is... So it looks like it's slightly smaller. It might be the second one that was born. And that's now attacking uh, Rosaline. And a flare's gone up. And we can see a stranger stood in the light with his gun up in the air. I think that looks so cool. And we're intro and we're introduced to David, who has come to save the day. Now the crew are all confused because obviously at this point they don't know that uh, who that is. They're only aware of Shaw. And her signal that she sent out. So they have no idea who this uh, mysterious figure is. Now I really like the music in this section. It's um, It's got this very... I want to use the term... It's got like a very Egyptian feeling to it which uh, I think fits the, the mood and the atmosphere of the Engineer City or the Citadel I think they call it and it's such a haunting place and I think the music fits it really well This, I mean look how many bodies are there and it's just such a striking image this entire city of I don't know. I think he says. I think Ridley Scott says in the commentary of like ten billion or ten million people or engineers, uh, all living in this uh, one city, and they're all all dead. 
Now, some people, you know, have expressed that they don't like the design of the uh, the engineer city, and they they wanted it to look more Geiger esque. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not of that mindset. I really like the the look of it because in the story, the engineers are meant to be, you know, our creators, and you have things like the Egyptian pyramids and Aztec pyramids and all that sort of stuff. You know, real real life mysterious ancient civilizations. And to see a city on an alien world that looks like that, with as we're seeing now on screen, the Hall of Heads, like these giant, uh, you know, almost disturbing giant faces in the rock, and and the way the way the city looks, it's like it's almost too close to home, but in a in a good way. And it, and it, and I think it makes the engineers all the more uh, realistic in a way. You know they have they have the Geiger esque looking ships and stuff, and it makes you wonder, you know, why they design them that way. But if the entire planet had had looked like that, I think, I, I want to say it would grow old fast. I I, I kind of like the, the the you know the simplicity of having their design of their city and the way they you know build stuff to to harken back to what we know humans you know, had, had built in the past in real life. Just seems to, to bring it all home, in a way. Anyway, I'm talking over the introduction of David, so he's just took an, taken his hood off and uh, said that Shaw died in the crash and he's been marooned here for 10 years. And the pathogen, he says, was designed to kill all non bio Botanical, botanical uh, life forms so it would use some of them as incubators for other life forms as we know like neomorphs and some of them it would just you know disintegrate or kill outright which uh, I think appeased a lot of the grievances with Prometheus a lot of people said well, what's going on with the black goo why does it work this way for some and work this way for the others um, basically it depends on almost like what the black goo wants to do with you <laughs> now it's interesting that that character there I think it's Cole says uh, you know we can't get a signal out through all this and then he looks up and looks at it and goes stone uh, like like he looks at it he, he wants to say it's stone but at the same time he he doesn't quite know what it could be made of, and I do like that because you know, it, it it's rock, but you know, he he's now starting to doubt where they are and what's you know happening. Now, I for years I had wanted to see two androids on screen together in an alien film. And with Covenant, we finally got that with David and Walter. And uh, and it was really interesting that they chose to do that because um, back when Prometheus came out, I wrote a little fan script, or I began one. I wrote the first 50 pages for a, you know, a sequel to Prometheus that I called Paradise. And uh, I had a robot and another android in there called Edward and... They met David later on, and I I'd written into the script that David and Edward look exactly the same. And when I saw this, I was like, "This is like they read my mind." <laughs> um, so I was really pleased that we finally got two androids on screen together because in every Alien film, you only usually had one. And I thought it'd be interesting to see like what uh, you know would happen character-wise if two androids met and one was. Uh, you know, a little bit uh, glitchy and, and not all there, and the other one was, you know, still together, let's put it that way. Now, we just passed the scene where David was uh, talking about the storm, and he said how it, the, the storm can kind of hide the planet from sensors in a way. It, like, completely hides the planet because it, the, um, I think it's an ion storm. Or oh, plasma storm, that's it. Uh, you know, can prevent you know people from finding it. So that kind of answers why when they scanned the area, 
um, that they never found this planet to begin with because uh, you know the storms keep it hidden and that also explains how the uh, engineers have been working dare I say not too far away from home but you know, keeping a watchful eye on us and and who, other planets they've potentially seeded throughout the uh, galaxy. And here we're getting a sense of uh, David's persona, how he how he's changed since uh, we last saw him. You know, in Prometheus, he was very much under Wayland's thumb, and he expressed in that film several times, and we could see it. You know, when he wasn't being watched by other characters, that he enjoyed exploring and creating. And now we find him; he's been left on a planet alone for ten years, and uh, for a robot that has emotions, he's uh, it's not done him good. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna have a little sip of Earl Grey. Mm. <coughs> and now we come to one of the most uh, talked about scenes in the in the entire film, which is a. Uh, David and Walter, uh, you know, David teaching Walter how to play the flute. Now, I love this sequence because obviously, as I've just mentioned, uh, you know, having two robots, two androids on screen together and uh, their sort of cl conflicting personalities is something I'd wanted to see for a while. Um, you know, when I grew up, I watched Alien and Ash was this, you know, glitchy robot that uh, caused many deaths. And then Bishop in Aliens was this kind of kind hearted uh, android. And I always thought, it would, would it be cool to see a movie where you've got ro two robots like that meeting? You know, and how would they interact with one another? And so I, it's almost like I can't believe my own eyes when I watch this film because this is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> I never would have thought it would have been like an android teaching another one to play the flute, but I'm not complaining because I think the... I want to use the term poetry in the kind of a robot teaching another robot to create via the simple melody of a, of a flute is a is a really nice touch it's kind of sweet in uh, in its essence and now david admits to walter that he thinks Wayland was entirely unworthy of his creation, which is him talking about himself. And he just says he was human, because Walter asks, what was he like? Because obviously Walter had never met uh, Wayland, which I do find odd, because you'd think they'd have like files on record to upload into Walter's database of like who... Um, or what Wayland was like, but then at the same time, they could have been, uh, you know, false memories. So maybe Walter just wanted to know, like, what he was uh, really like. And now David says, You're not allowed to create even a simple tune which is the uh you know the reason why david uh is frustrated by the way he was treated as walter is now pointing out he was too human he you know 
Yeah, a lot of complications. I just love this backwards and forwards between these two characters. I think it's a uh, very refreshing. Even the the like the set design of this like stone walls with all these drawings that David has done across it. It's a uh, it's nice and refreshing to see in an alien film. And uh, and I like the look of it because it's it's almost as if they're surra they are surrounded by uh David's mind. You know, his creations literally splatter the walls. Now the character's just gone off to wash herself and clean herself and Captain Orem's, you know, allow, allowed her to do this and I know I've heard a few people complain about how that's, you know, a stereotypical trope of horror films to have a character go off on their own. You know, you just know something bad's going to happen. However, I, I, I say, yeah, it is a trope, but also at the same time it makes sense because David says that they're you know they're perfectly safe in this place which uh you know they shouldn't they don't, obviously don't feel 100% safe because as the two characters here are saying like you know he says to Danny Captain Oren says to Danny you know you were right about this place but um at this point in time a robot is not allowed to harm a human so they take his word for it and she only goes round the corner I do believe it's not too far away So it never really bothered me, is what I'm saying. And now we have a flashback to uh, when Shaw and David arrived at the uh, at the planet, and we can see this giant docking station coming out to meet the ship. And we've got all the engineers waving and celebrating. They're rushing out to to see them home. I absolutely love this sequence. I think it's so, so well done. And uh, very believable. And now David decides to uh, cause genocide with the engineers. He releases the pathogen as we're seeing here and it just decimates everyone. So now I, whether all of the engineers are dead is, is is still up for debate. At the moment, I'm inclined to say I believe the engineers are all dead. Um, I'd be very surprised if they do appear again in another film. Um, but then again, who knows? We might, you know, we might see them again. But. I'm inclined to think that in the story, as we're seeing here, the engineers, they got wiped out by David. And if if it is the case that all the engineers have been killed, I, I do really like that idea because it kind of makes space feel lonely. You know, in the alien universe, there are humans, engineers, and the alien, or the pathogen, or whatever you want to call it. And removing the engineers in terms of major sort of characters that we're we're dealing with does leave us alone with the alien. And that makes I think Ripley's story all the more powerful because she is fighting a force to be reckoned with and winning. But yeah, I think the alien universe has this kind of they've always managed to tap into this kind of like emptiness and loneliness of space and I think you know the killing off the engineers adds to that but if they do appear in some capacity again I'm not going to complain either because you know you can imagine what those engineers if they're still alive would think coming back to their home world and, and finding it uh, decimated if that's what we see in the next film um, you know, as as we saw a minute ago, David and Shaw arrive on the planet and the entire population of this city comes out to greet them. So it shows that the engineers who go out to seed planets and and stuff are, are, are looked at like almost like astronauts here on Earth. 
You know, they're celebrated when they come home. And here we see the uh, the neomorph, the remaining neomorph, running towards the uh, the citadel and climbing the wall. Such a uh, very um, ape-like movements. It's almost like a lemur. Yeah, you're washing yourself now, but you better keep that gun in your hand. <laughs> She's washing her wounds from when the Neomorph that is about to appear uh, attacked her earlier. Ugh. It's hideous because it looks like it just poked holes, like perfect holes, straight into her arm. Like Morse code. <laughs> straight up her arm. And there you go, the Neomorph bites into her neck and decapitates her. It is it is um, you know, a little cliche, but it's it's not the worst. At least no one walked up behind her and put their hand on her shoulder and went, Hey, like that and made her jump. <laughs> that would have been really cliche. So now they've managed to get communications back up with the main ship and uh, Tennessee who is in command is trying to get the ship as close to the storm as possible to boost the communication. It's risky business because obviously they've got 2,000 colonists or so on board and you know they don't want to risk the uh, risk the lives of all those but as soon as they said to uh, to Tennessee over the comms that uh, you know there's been casualties, they're going, you know they're all agreeing that they should get closer. And it's really cool. You can see all like bits of rain and and you know stuff coming off the uh, off the ship there as it enters the storm. They're getting very very close. <laughs> Now this image of the Neomorph crouched over uh, Rosal Rosalind's body is so hideous. And the way like it looks at David and instantly stands up upright and mimics his movements and I think that is just one of the most spine tingling things for these creatures to do like you know we've seen it through through the first bit of the movie running around on all fours like a like a lemur as i've said but then as soon as it sees david it stands up like completely upright like a human and walks over and it's it's just such a hideous image it makes you wonder like what do the neomorphs think of david like how do they how do they see him and it definitely plays into david feeling like he's a he's a god in a way but orum is having none of that and he just shoots it <laughs> Now it's also, uh, you know, interesting to think about that the neomorphs don't have acid blood. 
you know, they definitely have some form of acid in them because when it bites off uh, Walter's hand, you hear the hiss of like the acid melting. But when Orem shoots it there, there's no acid or anything. So this is the really important bit. A lot of people said and complained about how uh, Captain Orem just follows David wherever he goes. And the bit we just saw there where he's like, you need to show me what, what's going on or I'm going to completely fuck up your composure. You know, David stops for a second and then instantly turns and says, right this way, Captain. And we have to remember Orem robots aren't designed to kill humans. So he he trusts David to the point that he's, uh, you know, he he believes David isn't there to directly cause harm to him. Also, Orem feels like he's got all the cards in his hand because he's holding on to a massive machine gun. And also, he just took out one of the Neomorphs. So why Orem trusts David to fo you know, follow him down is because he feels like he's got all the cards in his hand. And as he said earlier on in the film, as I spoke about, he he's uh, navigating the path as it unfolds before him. You could also look at it this way, that, you know, David was blowing on the Neomorph to gain its trust. And he says that, you know, Orem could be looking at that as like, you know, this robot has gone glitchy, but... You know, he but he just believes it's an animal that can be trusted or whatever. And now we see one of the most impressive sets in the film, which is David's, uh, you know, his room of creation, I want to say. You can see all the creatures and stuff that he's created and, you know, he's tested upon different, mixing different DNA and all that sort of stuff. It's a very, um, reminds me very much of Frankenstein, but also they mention Mary Shelley uh, and her works of Frankenstein in this film. So David is inspired by... He believes he's inspired by Ozymandias, but obviously it's uh, Frankenstein. And I think that this is a really, really hideous, uh, you know, place. I mean, you, you just look at this room, there's always something to look at, and it's always some sort of disturbing imagery. And now we see the eggs. Now, David, as the creator of the alien, I really like. I think that's a really cool idea. And I'll elaborate that on a minute, in a minute. But, you know, the idea that the alien is birthed for the first time in this room that we're seeing here, this, like, dark basement in the middle of space, is, like, where else could you imagine the alien coming into the world and also by, not by natural design, it was designed by a, by a monster. <laughs> and I think this is the perfect setting for, for the birth of the alien. Now obviously every audience member would be saying, no, don't take a look, get out of there Aurum, while you still can. But of course, like all nightmares, he has to look at it. And that's, you know, Aurum's undoing. It's very much like uh, Kane in Alien. When Kane says, there seems to be eggs or something. And you're like, oh, get out of there, don't go near the eggs. Something bad's going to happen. <laughs> but 
but yeah Dave, david being the creator of the alien is uh something i really like um because david shouldn't exist he's a a monster in himself and as you know walter is the proof that the hu you know Wayland the Wayland company and humans didn't like David because he was you know too human he was unpredictable and he disturbed a lot of people so to have that kind of you know creature let's put it that way make the alien using you know the pathogen and uh, the DNA of other humans to create it's just such a disturbing idea i think like david shouldn't exist and then that means the alien really shouldn't exist but obviously there's a lot of speculation in the fan community of alien and uh, and some people who watch the film whether david is the real creator because there's a lot of hints in this film that you know he believes he's the creator of the alien but is he really because in prometheus as we know uh, the engineers created the, uh, the the neomorphs. They were already a thing because we see a mural of uh, of uh, an alien like creature on the wall. So we know that the the engineers have already created something similar. But David is sort of the the you know the entity that had created the xenomorph that looks and acts the way we know it to to be. Now something I just want to mention quickly before this alien bursts out of Aurum, uh they said it would take eight hours for the lander to reach the planet's surface after they've you know stripped it of all the stuff that they don't need on it to rescue the people on the planet. So again, I go back to the jump in time. You know, we've jumped eight hours now. And eight hours later splat <laughs> the alien is born Ugh, it just looks so violent I love this sequence it's so it's such a weird like weird imagery this tiny little alien translucent little beast comes out of his chest sheds its uh, sack that it's in and then raises its arm and its spindly little arms and imitates David to this soft piano music and I think it's just so creepy and just uh, just really gets under my skin and then we see what's left of Shaw, which is, uh, <laughs> again, really disturbing. And you're like, what has David done to Shaw over the last few years? I'm like, messing around with that engineer technology. So that could be very well been the first ever xenomorph, as we know it, being born into the universe. Which uh, yeah, I really I really like. I think I think they nailed that the whole look, the the idea of the alien being birthed in that hideous basement in the middle of space is just yeah perfect. But then again, as we know, as we've mentioned, you know, they could they could change all that with the next film. We could find out that David has uh, been living a lie. As uh, we find out in this sequence, Walter points out that David, you know, has had the Ozymandias uh, quote wrong all this time. It was actually Shelley who said the quote of Ozymandias, which uh, David had been quoting for, you know, earlier on in the film. So he got he gets a fact wrong and that really doesn't sit well with David. And I know in the uh, novelization of uh, of Alien Covenant, it's mentioned that the egg that um, 
David picks up in the in his uh, lab that when he's showing Aurum, you know, the one that's been sliced in sections, that that in the novelization it's described that he found that egg on the planet. So they outright say that David isn't the original creator of the Xenomorph, but I think that they changed that for the theatrical release. So there we go. Shelley. When one note is off, it eventually destroys the whole symphony, David. And there you go. Basically saying that David has been corrupted by his own, uh, you know, mistake. The whole symphony of androids. You could you could take what uh, Walter says to David there in many different ways. David admitting that he created a perfect organism on this planet. And there we go, we've got <laughs> Michael Fassbender kissing himself. And then killing himself. Stabbing the flute right in his neck. Now the music in this sequence. Uh, really sounds like Alien 3. Like a, a moment from Alien 3's score. And I, and I really appreciated that when I first saw it in the cinema. It always lets me, it leads me to believe that the. Uh, the composer had gone back and. Uh, through the Alien films and taken bits out of each film and kind of put them all together to tell a new story with the music now I love that there's like a, a giant dead face hugger on the side there it's a, sort of in the in the foreground and then this room here is uh, David's drawing room. I've watched the behind-the-scenes footage uh, video of... Uh, uh, what's his name? From uh, Tested, Adam Savage. And he pulls out all these tubes of drawings, the rolled-up bits of paper, and, and they've all got drawings on them. It's just that little detail, even though you never see it in the film. And now Lope has gone down into the egg chamber and he's trying to look for Captain Orem. And then suddenly, yep, there's a face hugger. <laughs> I like how the face hugger goes and hides and then launches out and instantly gets itself on. Um, on Lope. Oh, sorry, it was Cole. Cole who uh, went down into the basement. Lope is the guy, yeah, on the floor. Now we see that the face hugger, you know, dies, and uh, you see its little uh, proboscis retracting back inside its body. So for those alien fans, they know something's uh, happened. And then here we go, there's the. Xenomorph that was burst from Aurum and instantly takes out Cole, stabbing him through the head with its inner jaw. And this is where David is essentially revealing his hideous plan to, to Daniels. Now I really like that they show the um, android strength in this sequence.
it really makes da- like David a formidable force to be reckoned with. And I say like he's the most disturbing thing in this film for me. When I was younger, the alien scared me. But obviously being a fan of this franchise and watching it over and over and over again, that fear subsided in, you know, and I... I I've obviously, the alien is still a scary entity. But I hadn't felt, you know, watching Prometheus... Well, not so much Prometheus, but watching, like, Alien Resurrection and all that. I, like, the aliens weren't that scary. AVP films, the aliens weren't scary. And when I rewatched Alien, Aliens and Alien 3... I wasn't as scared as the alien as I used to be. So for a while I hadn't been disturbed by something in an alien film for a while. Now, watching Covenant, I wasn't so much scared of the aliens in this film as much as I was when I first watched Alien. But I was scared of David because I think he's he's such a disturbing, messed up character and you know as as a creative myself the idea of being you know the idea of not being able to create is frustrating so like what scares me about him is you you see kind of a lot of your i can see a lot of like people's fears in real life in david and you know him going mad because of it is uh is what really hits home And we see the androids fighting and David gives uh, Walter an, an ultimatum. Them or me. Serve in heaven or reign in hell. Which is it to be? And we have to wait and see. I think they really did... Uh, did a good job with those two androids fighting in that previous scene. It, um, you know, looked cool. Didn't look overly cheesy. Convincing. You know, the robots seemed like they had very precise movements. And now we see Walter leaving the Citadel and coming out to meet the others and T Tennessee is now here to pick them up it's really cool from those like aerial shots you can see how vast the city is now we see the alien standing upright and then it begins to give chase I love this sequence. I think it's really cool. This whole lander trying to take off with the alien on it scene. I think it's really well done. I love how Daniels just gets the gun and just goes out there. She's just going to take it on. She just doesn't give a damn. The special effects in this sequence are, are, are again, really impressive. The... They built an entire practical lander for them to, to, you know, use. And then the way they integrated the special effects with it is uh, really impressive. And I love, I just love this whole set piece, you know, with Daniels flying around <laughs> on this rope and the alien crawling around all over the ship and they're flying past this like giant golden tower you know, crashing on the roof of the citadel so it's a fun sequence and 
Now we see the alien cr crawling over the cockpit and deciding to try and get in to, to kill Tennessee. Now when um, Daniel starts up the crane, or Tennessee starts up and the crane swings round, there's this uh, particular siren that goes off and I just absolutely love it. There's just something about that siren in an alien film and the alien coming down to look at, you know, to look at Daniels and, and face her. I don't know, I just love this sequence and the fact that the giant crane looks like a mouth and the alien decides to try and take it on <laughs> is, uh, is really cool. It gets trapped in there and it throws the weight off as we're seeing here and the whole you know, ship is tilting to the side. It's like you'd think it'd be easier to take off but this one alien is causing them so many problems. <laughs> And Daniels just simply closes the uh, the crane's, I want to use the word hand, and the alien has been completely crushed and ripped to shreds. And of course they have to knock a head off one of the statues. <laughs> I just love it, it's pandemonium. The characters are getting thrown around inside the... Inside the uh, hull of the ship you've got Daniels running on the ground as the ship pulls her back up into the air and now with the crane arm put back into uh, position all is well now if you look in the background of this sequence when they you know, leave the planet, you can see in the mountains, or like in between a valley, you can see that docking ship that, you know, when David and Shaw arrived on the planet, that big uh, docking ship that met them is lying in the, uh, in the uh, valley, all destroyed. It's just a nice little detail that uh, I noticed some fans picked up on it, and I, I didn't notice it the first time I saw the film. We should be seeing it in a few seconds. There it is. You can see it in the background. They like putting faces in things, these engineers. <laughs> and now we enter the fourth act, which every pretty much every alien film has. You know, they think... The characters think they've uh, gotten away and they've escaped. But us alien fans know this it's not over yet. Now some fans have taken issue with the timing of things. Especially with the, the timing of the face hugger. You know, injecting the embryo into... Uh, oh, I keep forgetting his name now. It wasn't Cole. Uh, Lope. Now, the, the embryo's gestation time takes a perfect amount of time. I think uh, Daniel says to Tennessee that, you know, the computer's going to take uh, a few hours. I think it's say like eight bells or something to, to reboot because she took a bit of a knocking in the storm. And then the alien's born. So the alien's gestation in uh, Lope's chest takes, you know, the right amount of time. What people take issue with is the amount of time the face hugger was actually on uh, Lope. And I, I just think, you know, this it's an early version of the face hugger. You know, it, all it had to do was eject the embryo and then wait. So I, I kind of gathered that it makes sense. I mean, it's different to what we've seen before, but it, it doesn't bother me too much. I think this is where Tennessee says how long the computer takes to reboot. Yeah, he says, uh, I took Mother offline, she needs a full diagnostic. She's got the ship beaten out of her in the storm and a lot of EM damage. She'll be back in line, yeah, in eight bells, so. 
And I'm guessing that means about eight hours. And now Daniels is captain. So we cut to eight hours later and the computer restarts. The subtitles just said mother powering up. And instantaneously she wakes up the crew because there's an unknown alien on board. And we can see Walter here looking at a computer screen. Now it's interesting to note that uh, Walter didn't wake up the crew for any reason. There, there was something going on in the med bay, and they, and Walter <laughs> didn't do anything. So, you know, there's your first clue. Is it Walter? Is it Walter? Or is it David? Dun, dun, dun. He's got this like kind of slightly cocky look on his face. So there we can see that he, um the the body of Lope just ripped to shreds in the med bay. So this is something uh, I think is interesting when you look at this film and compare it to other alien films. The ship that they're on is relatively simply designed. Like there is, you know, it's not overly complicated like the Nostromo was or Fury 161 from Alien 3 or even the Auroga from Alien Resurrection. This ship is very simply designed, you know. And as I mentioned at the start of the commentary with the whole cameras, now the cameras come into play with, uh, you know, they can use the cameras to follow the alien and track it. Which uh, they meant they have cameras on the Nostromo in Alien, but they uh, they mentioned that those are particular cameras have been uh, taken out. I can't remember the exact reason. It was either taken out by the... There was a power loss on a certain level in Alien. And there we go. Both characters are dead in the shower. <laughs> but no, so I think like with this ship design, if you look at the corridors, they're, you know, it's, it's very simply laid out. So that's why they, could, uh, they, can, they have more... Uh, manipulation over where they can move the alien to if they want it in a specific area they can shut off certain corridors and sort of force it into where they want it to go which I thought was a you know a cool way of kind of mixing things up It's, it's almost like the humans in this whole end sequence kind of have the upper hand over the alien. But what they don't realise is this whole thing is almost being dictated via Walter slash David. Who's watching from uh, from afar. Because, uh, you know, as as I've spoiled already, the and as you probably should know, because you've got this far into the commentary, you know, David is on the ship with them. It's, it's not Walter, as far as we know. I'll explain more in a minute. But uh, he's helping them. He's specifically, you know, helping them trap the alien and move it to where they need it to go. He, If he wanted them dead, he could have very easily led the alien straight to them. So I think it's interesting to to note that uh, he's he's helping them. God, I love that shot of the alien looking 
walking up to the door. Now also we can see what the alien's seeing and it it's following where the doors are opening but it also realizes that it's being watched because you know it walks up to this door here it opens and then as we see here the alien goes to go, go to that door and the door closes and it takes a moment looks up at the camera and takes it out so it shows how intelligent this thing is. It's already worked out it's being watched. And that's a surprise to David. Slash Walter. <laughs> now these suits here look very similar to the one seen at the end of Alien. Not entirely the same, but just sort of similar in design. More bulkier than the ones we saw in Prometheus, you know. As we move closer to Alien, things are starting to look a little bit more like, you know, what we know to, you know, come to recognise. Also, the cameras and the torches on their shoulder pads, uh, you know, are kind of like what the Marines have in, in Aliens. I love how violent violent this alien is like it gets its foot caught on that netting and it's it's just determined and I I think they got the movements of it down the way it's like using its hands to move and and stuff is really uh really cool They've got it trapped inside the uh, vehicle's cockpit. Oh, and that sound, when they open up the airlock doors, like that sound of the air being rushed out is... It sounds almost like the alien from the original film when it screams. Which must have been a design choice. Like It must have been designed like that to, to sound that particular way. And now things start to go a little bit wrong. They're releasing the trucks. Trying to, you know, force the alien out into space. I always wonder what they're going to use to terraform with now. How are they going to build stuff about these machines? <laughs> Now Daniels waits right until the opportune moment to, to duck out of the way. And the alien is impaled and sent down to the planet. I love all these like, I want to say they're like globs of moisture that are floating through the air. I think it's a really cool like, it's almost like snow or ash from like a volcano or something. Or, or actually, like, you know, microorganisms. Kind of looks a little bit like that. I'm also pleased that Daniels didn't say, like, a cheesy one-liner before the alien jumped towards her. Like, she didn't stand there and go, Come and get me, you fucker! Or something like that. <laughs> it would have been very easy for them to do something like that, I think. But I'm glad they didn't uh, do that. And now finally the ship Covenant leaves Planet 4's atmosphere and continues on to Aurigai 6. Tennessee is put to, you know, not put to sleep like dead, but put in his cryotube. And Daniels 
gets into hers. Now this is one way to end the movie I think like in, in like this is a I would argue a proper horror film ending you know you've got someone going to bed and they're not going to wake up because they're in a cryo tube and the last thing that they know before going to sleep is that you know it's essentially like being put under by a doctor that the doctor is going to kill you. It's such a terrifying, nightmarish thing to think about. You know, we've seen what David's capable of as it's revealed right now that it's David who's on the ship, not Walter. And, you know, Daniels freaks out because she, she is terrified because she doesn't think she's ever going to wake up, which is just such a horrible thought to have and like she, well she doesn't even know if she's going to wake up at all or if she's going to wake up as some hideous experiment of David's now there is a lot of speculation whether this is actually David's body or Walter's body because a lot of fans out there speculate that perhaps David is in Walter's body here. Because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that. You know, the hair, the fact that David's voice was all messed up when Walter was smashing him in the face with the rock. And then when they meet up with, when Walter meets up with them, his voice is okay. So, I don't know, I'm more inclined to think that this is meant to be David. But part of me does understand where the doubts come from. And it would be quite a nice idea to think that maybe David is almost like a corruption in, in androids, in a way. Like he can corrupt an android and any corrupt android becomes like a David. And they start calling themselves that. But I don't know if that's thinking too much into it. And now we see him coughing up these little alien embryos, little facehugger embryos. And it's also um, a detail to note that when that drawer opened at the beginning of the film, there were many embryos in there. And then the whole bottom section is empty and he suddenly has two little facehuggers. So while the ship was rebooting its systems did David do some little experimentations while everyone was sleeping <laughs> but I guess we'll have to find out in the next film and we see him walking off looking proud in amongst 2,000 colonists who have no idea what's coming to them it's also interesting to note that he sends a message back to the company explaining about the accident and that they're on course for Aurigai 6 and he mentions as we just said he uh, he says it's Walter and he gives the security code that is Walter so again that's another piece of evidence to say that that's actually Walter who's been corrupted by David so there we go and now the credits roll so yeah I, I absolutely love this film I think it's uh, it's a really unique chapter in terms of look you know there's a lot of stuff in here that we've seen before like aliens on ships and, and blowing them out of airlocks and all that sort of stuff but the 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 main plot of this android that's been left on this planet for 10 years and has been experimenting and you've got the whole engineer city and mountains forests all that sort of stuff i really love all that sort of uh, look to the film i think the storyline is is awesome i love the fact that they've you know explained where the alien has come like the alien we know has come from but they haven't done it in a way that uh 
is entirely um you know it's not boring they've done it in a really really interesting way um and i'm r- hoping that uh they greenlight the next one and Ridley Scott can finish his trilogy that follows David because David is almost the anti Ripley. Uh, you know, Ripley tries to save the human race from these aliens that, uh, you know, could just wipe the entire human race out. She tries to prevent them from ever getting to earth. And David is the complete opposite. He created the alien. He wants to make more of them and he wants to see all humans dead. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I I really do hope that we you get this the next film and we see how the the two storylines kind of meet up. Um, yeah, I I hope you've enjoyed this commentary. Uh, it's been fun talking about it, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll uh, do some more alien commentaries for you guys soon if you've enjoyed this. Uh, yeah, so if you've liked this, please give me a like. Uh, if you haven't subscribed uh, and you'd like to subscribe. And uh, yeah, look forward to more alien related videos in the future um, on the Terradome. Have a good day, guys.